It is my uh, personal privilege to introduce to you the introducer of our guest. I have a class at 2.30. God knows how many of them will be in there. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will have taken careful notes. Uh, I told them about this conflict. So I really deeply regret that. I don't know how that happened, but it, it did. And so I, I will do this pleasant honor and then skip uh, to the Wiener Auditorium. I welcome you to this forum. Uh, it is a forum where we try to inspire people into public life, which is difficult enough in any time. But the co-sponsors of this event are the Harvard Radcliffe Black Students Association, the Association of Black Radcliffe Women, the Harvard Black Men's Forum, the Harvard Law School Black Students Association, the Kennedy School Black Student Caucus, and the Institute of Politics, the Student Advisory Committee. We promise here only a forum of respect and courtesy and civility. And we will do that. And it's tough sometimes, especially when there's someone with a concept or idea that people say, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're going to try to limit that from now on, like, oh, I can't believe. Well, enough of that. Now, <laughs> Charles, I met this man during a most unique part of American history, the Clarence Thomas hearings uh, to the nominee to the Supreme Court. Charles Ogletree is a Harvard Law professor, a prominent legal theorist, served as the moderator for several PBS series, including Ethics in America, and most recently, Liberty and Limits, Whose Law, Whose Order. Uh, he's been a guest commentator on several national news programs, including Nightline, McNeil, Lair, NewsHour, Larry King Live, Meet the Press. Also served as a legal commentator for NBC on the O.J. Simpson case. And of course, we shall miss our lovely friend, Fred Friendly. Uh, you and I both did those programs. What a wonderful man. Uh, he passed uh, from our midst yesterday, Fred Friendly. Charles has also served as legal counsel to Professor Anita Hill during the Senate confirmations hearings for Justice Clarence Thomas. And I seem to dimly recall that <laughs> somewhere back in our past. And uh, co-author of, of a recently published book, Beyond the Rodney King Story. He was a public defender in Washington, D.C. for seven years, received numerous awards, including the National Bar Association Presidential Award, the Justice Lewis Brandeis Public Service Awards, and Ellis Island Medal of Honor. A superb attorney and a very capable professor at the Harvard Law School, and we're very pleased and proud to have you here, sir. Thank you very much, Senator Simpson. Uh, and of course, just as I'm about to make my remarks, he walks away. Uh, that happened seven years ago as well. But, uh, <laughs> but we, we have the final word here today. It, it is a distinct honor and privilege to be able to uh, introduce an extraordinary uh, human being uh, today. Uh, Johnny Cochran is really a, a model of uh, excellent uh, lawyering, having uh, worked in almost every imaginable legal capacity. Most people know him as a result of his representation of uh, O.J. Simpson. What most people don't know is that before Johnny Cochran even came on the horizon as O.J. Simpson's lawyer, he was a national success uh, and uh, as a both a former prosecutor in the same office that prosecuted O.J. Simpson and more importantly uh, as a private lawyer who represented uh, countless individuals uh, in the city of Los Angeles and the state of California uh, on claims of uh, discrimination and most particularly police misconduct and police brutality. Uh, he is responsible through his firm for the largest uh, judgments in the history of California in a number of cases involving police brutality. He uh, has a keen sense about the public's interest in trying to protect themselves and protect their individual rights and liberties. 
Uh, he is a native of Shreveport, Louisiana, but spent most of his uh, formative years in Los Angeles going to UCLA and then later to Loyola uh, for law school. I mentioned his public service. He was a city attorney for a few years in Los Angeles. He then worked uh, as an assistant district attorney uh, with people like uh, Gil Garcetti, and I believe Judge Lance Ito uh, was around at the same time. Uh, and so there was a familiarity uh, when they met again a few years ago. Uh, Johnny uh, also has represented a number of kind of unknown uh, and unheralded clients. Some of you may recall that when Los Angeles almost went up in smoke uh, because of the acquittal of the police officers in the Rodney King case, uh, there was one person who caught the nation's eye because the unmerciful and unjustified beating that he took. That was Reginald Denny. Uh, Johnny Cochran was called, as you might expect, by many community leaders to represent the African-American defendants who were prosecuted uh, for that crime and other crimes. And he chose not to do that. Uh, Johnny Cochran actually represented Reginald Denny and other victims of brutality as a result of the lawlessness that followed the riots in Los Angeles uh, in early, the early 1990s. Uh, he has also uh, published the very popular and commercially successful Journey to Justice. It talks not just about the O.J. Simpson case, but about the person, the personal journey that he has uh, uh, followed. More importantly, if you read the book, it's, it's, it's significant that it doesn't start with a victory but a defeat. He talks about the case that has concerned him most of his life. That's the representation of Geronimo Pratt, uh, who was convicted in the 1970s, spent more than 20 years in prison, and was recently released because of the excellent efforts of a number of lawyers, including uh, Johnny Cochran. It's that journey to justice and his pursuit of that journey to justice that makes him the most appropriate person to join us today to talk about finding justice within the criminal justice system. Uh, after he gives uh, his presentation, it will be followed by my colleague, uh, Randall Kennedy, who I'll introduce then. And then uh, Mr. Cochran will have a brief rebuttal, and then we'll take questions from you. But as he continues on that journey through justice through the Arkell Center at the Kennedy School in Cambridge, Massachusetts, please join me in welcoming Johnny Cochran. Thank you very much, and thank you, my good friend Charles Ogletree, who is not only an outstanding professor, but just one wonderful lawyer and a, and a true Renaissance man. Those of us who were involved in laboring in the vineyard always looked to Charles, and we're always honored to have Charles on our team. It, it's great to be here today with you. It's always good to come back to Harvard and to see this uh, uh, wonderful audience and so many smiling young faces today as we talk about a very, very important subject, that of justice, justice in America. Finding justice within the criminal justice system. You know, it's been said by some that there is a peephole in the blindfold of Lady Justice. Think about that for a moment. A peephole in the blindfold of Lady Justice. As we talk about this elusive quality of justice in America. Justice is always challenging. And it's always difficult to obtain. Things have gotten better. This year, we celebrate the 35th anniversary of Gideon versus Wainwright, the case which talked about the rights of the indigent of the defendant to have legal counsel. We celebrate this year the 30th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report. Remember that report? Many of you weren't born at that point, but you probably have heard about it. After the civil unrest of the 1960s and 68, the Kerner Commission, Governor Kerner, came out with a report that said we were moving toward two societies, one black, one white, both separate and unequal. And just last week, another report came out by the Eisenhower Foundation, which said the Kerner Commission report was absolutely right. We have, in fact, moved toward these two societies. It's affected how we live, how we interact. It's affected the concept of justice in America. And so today, I, I wanted to talk with you about this whole concept, because realizing that what, your doc, what Dr. King said back in 1968 is so true today that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. With that thought in mind, let's look for a moment at justice in America as we now know it. When you think about where we are in 1998 and you, you hear all the proposed legal reforms, it's interesting. In my home state of California, they want to 
they wanted to propose less than unanimous verdicts. They have, throughout the nation, subscribed to and endorse a diminution in appellate rights. There has been a proposal to have IQ tests for jurors. <coughs> we have mandatory sentences across this land. We've seen an expansion of the death penalty. There's even been a bill to try and stop lawyers or to limit what lawyers can say in closing argument. All of these things, and now we've seen an unprecedented attack on the attorney-client privilege, something that our distinguished moderator is very much involved in now, an extraordinary breach in the attorney-client privilege. All of these things to diminish that which the Constitution has guaranteed everybody who's charged with a crime, who is presumed to be innocent until the contrary is shown. And of course, in case of a reasonable doubt, that person is entitled to an acquittal. I guess the heart of it, and perhaps the best example I can use at the outset is this. Since 1973, 69 individuals have walked off death row, having been found factually innocent. 69 out of 6,000 who've been sentenced to death row. Now, think about that. That's one in 100. Put another way, suppose you manufactured a new plane, and you went to the FAA or to Boeing or somebody and said, look, I've got this new plane. And it's a great plane, looks great, works great. We say it's great, but it'll crash one in 100 times. Think the FAA would uh, buy into that plane? I don't think so. Well, those are the facts regarding the death penalty in this society at this time. 69 have walked off death row out of 6,000 sentenced. Justice Brennan, a wise, wise man, understood that. Back in 1994, he said the following, that perhaps the bleakest fact of all is that the death penalty is imposed not only in a freakish and discriminatory manner, but also in some cases upon defendants who are actually innocent. And so I fear that some today would make that just the cost of business, the fact that we execute an innocent person. It's just the cost of business, we move on in our effort to get it right. You know, they do call it practicing law, and we keep on practicing until we get it right, but for the individual who's put to death, he doesn't want you practicing on him or her, I'm sure, I assure you of that. There are several recent reports that I'd like to allude to just, just briefly. In my home state of California recently, in uh, the end of 1996, there's a report by the Center on Juvenile and Criminal Justice, which I think you'll find very interesting. This report <coughs> said that a staggering 40% of California's African-American men in their 20s were either in prison, on probation, or on parole. 40% in their 20s, if you can imagine that. And it didn't just stop there. It went on to talk about this great, great disparity as we seek to battle this war on crime. So in California, where African Americans are probably less than 10% of the population, in Los Angeles County, where I reside at least part of the time, an African American is 17 times more likely to be charged with a third strike. That's the third strike where you go to prison for the rest of your life for a simple crime. If you have two serious felonies, the third strike can be like stealing a pizza, which we had recently. Go to prison for the rest of your life. 17 times more likely to be charged. Or in San Francisco, a bastion of liberalism, so, so thought. You're 13 times more likely to be charged with this third strike in this so-called war on drugs. And it, it hasn't only affected African-American males, it's affected African-American women. The number of black women in prison has, ro has risen greatly in the past decade. So now, about 3% of African American women in their 20s in California are now under the control of the state's criminal justice system compared to 5% of white men, almost at parity. It continues. The data supports disparity at every level of the criminal justice system, according to the author report. And needless to say, this report received in some quarters with skepticism, but by others who said, we knew it all of the time. In the so-called war on drugs, 
you all heard about this so-called 100 to 1 disparity, where African-American males, generally in their 20s, charged with these federal offenses. Generally speaking, if an African-American male under this disparity has five grams of crack cocaine, he's sentenced to a mandatory sentence of five years in prison. It would take a matron in suburbia would have to have 100 grams of pure powdered cocaine to get that same sentence of five years. Now, the Congress is going to reduce that to 10 to 1, but that's still a great disparity and still quite, quite unfair. This is the state of justice in our society. In California right tonight, an African-American male in his or her 20s is five times more likely to be murdered than to be eligible for admission to the University of California. This is that society that Governor Kerner was talking about. This is the justice system they were talking about. Well, it's not all this. And so we, we, we talk about this report, this report by the Center of Juvenile and Criminal Justice, and it's pretty startling. It bespeaks an America that sees a vision that I hope that those, those in this room do not share, a vision of America that has barbed wire from sea to shining sea. You travel around America now and in many cities, the newest building you see in the town is the new prison. It's the biggest growth industry, is the new prisons, locking people up at alarming rates. But these people will have to get out someday, and they've got to return to our communities. They'll be meaner, tougher, less educated, and they've got to find their way back into the society. Do we write them off, or what do we do? I dare say, as they said in California, if 40% of young white males were in prison, parole, or probation. We do something about it. We do something about education. We do something about joblessness. We do something about hopelessness. We do something about the whole process to change things around. But this report was met largely by people who said, well, so be it. And I don't think that's acceptable in a civilized society. And of course, there are other reports. In another report in December of 1996 in Los Angeles entitled, And Justice for some, they looked at all of the homicides that had occurred in Los Angeles over the course of the last several years. And they tried to look and see what happens with people who are charged with crimes and what happens with the victims of these crimes. And here's what they found in this report. That one of the most startling things was the victim's race. Cases involving white victims were more likely to be solved by police. And suspects once caught were more likely to be charged with crimes carrying a potential death penalty. Now, that's no real surprise. Now, there are all kind of reasons for that. But those are the facts, that the outcomes differ based upon the victim's race, based upon the suspect's race, and of course, based upon who investigated, which police department actually investigated the particular offense. Now, if that wasn't enough, then, in a recent report just out last week, the Atlanta Journal and Constitution has a report out now called Unequal Justice, which is what we really are talking about. In this report of unequal justice, they talk about the situation in Georgia. Let me share just a couple of facts with you. Essentially, it says that white criminals in Georgia are much more likely to avoid prison for serious crimes than black people who commit the same offenses. And in looking at this, they analyzed some 2.4 million sentences. The analysis shows that white criminals in Georgia since 1990 were between 30 and 60 percent more likely than blacks to get probation. Probation is when you get to go home instead of prison for drug offenses, for violent crimes, and other crimes against persons. The disparity exists, although the prior criminal records were about the same among blacks and whites. This report came to us after looking, as I said, 2.4 million sentences of adult criminal cases. It goes on to point out that if the apparent racial disparity in sentencing helps to explain why Georgia's prison population is two-thirds black in a state where the population is only one-third black. And so it postulates that if whites had been sentenced to Georgia prisons, at the same rate as blacks. About 20,000 more white criminals would have gone to prison during the last eight years, according to this analysis of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution. And that's more than half the current capacity of the state prison 
system. My good friend with the Southern Center for Human Rights in Atlanta, Stephen Bright, says it thusly. He says, this is a part of the legacy and a long history in excluding African Americans in all aspects of the criminal justice system in Georgia. He says, what you see reflected in these numbers are the racial biases, where the conscious or unconscious of prosecutors and judges who see white people as kleptomaniacs and black people as thieves, who see white youths as trouble and black youths as thugs. And so he then spells it out, and he is a man who has fought very, very hard against the death penalty in Georgia, a state that has a, a, an abominable record. And then, of course, there's the anecdotal kind of information that, that comes up. And I don't want to deal in a lot of anecdotes, but I think I would be remiss where I not to just share quickly three of them, because I think they're very timely. Some of you may know that just last week in Missouri, a young man named Reginald Powell was put to death. Reginald Powell committed a horrible crime when he was 18 years of age. He killed two men. And here he was faced with the death penalty. But there's something very interesting about it. Our, us as a society now. He, they tried to spare his life, but the governor of Missouri wouldn't do anything about it. He's now 10 years older. His lawyer was a woman of 35 years of age who became emotionally involved with Powell, who is mildly retarded. Some of you may have seen this on Dateline. They supposedly fell in love. She was blinded by supposedly this love. And so the prosecutor came to her one day and said, look, your client pleads guilty, we'll give him life in prison. She didn't think that was good enough and she could do better. She made some terrible mistakes along the way in representing this man. The upshot of it is, is that he got the death penalty when she didn't think he would. He was sentenced to the death penalty. She came forward and after they found the letters that had been exchanged between the two of them and, and confessed that she had fallen in love with him, that they'd had this relationship that went on for a period of time, that it affected her representation, that he was not represented appropriately. And so I thought about this man, and I put him in perspective with Carla Faye Tucker, the young lady who, in Texas, who recently was put to death. And I thought about all those news cameras and people who were there to support her, and I'm a vehement, I'm in vehement opposition to the death penalty because I agree with Justice Brennan, discriminatorily applied. But then I thought about this young man, Reginald Powell, and I remember when I went to sleep in California that night, I woke up the next morning to see, did they spare him? What happened to him? And I could, had to look, I had to search to find. It was just another one they put to death. The governor never spared him. This happens over and over again. They'd offered to save him because his lawyer, he didn't have effective representation. But more close to home, when you talk anecdotally, when you talk about justice in America. In 1972, as a young lawyer, I had the pleasure to represent a young man named Geronimo Pratt. He was charged with a murder that he always said he didn't commit. And of course, I believed him, but most of your clients said they're innocent. But in this time, this man said it, and we believed it, and we thought we could prove it. He said something else, too. He said, Cochran, they're out to get me. He would always say that, and I would always say, who is they? Who's this amorphous they? Well, he was right and I was wrong. The, a, the they he was talking about was the FBI, because for the next 27 years after Geronimo Pratt was convicted, we spent the time trying to get him released. And the thing that renews my faith in the system, although it's not perfect, and you have to search very hard to get justice, especially if you're poor or indigent or the disenfranchised or unpopular, it's tough to get justice. But the thing that renews my faith is the fact that the same corrupt system that put Geronimo Pratt away and convicted him wrongfully it's the same system we used to get him an acquittal. Through the Freedom of Information Act, we kept getting documents, kept getting documents which showed that, sure enough, there was a program called COINTELPRO, or the Counterintelligence Program, that when J. Edgar Hoover said neutralize the Panthers, for Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, it meant kill them. For Geronimo Pratt, it meant keep them in prison forever. And the one thing about Geronimo Pratt that you had to be struck with, after he'd served 15, 16 years in prison, the parole board said, if you just say you did this, we'll work it out, we'll let you out. He says, oh, no, no, I'm innocent. I don't want out of here until I am receiving a reversal from the court. So we all drew strength from what he was talking about. But yet we kept getting these dockets where we were able to finally 
established that the key witness in the case was an FBI informant. Not only that, he was an informant for the LAPD and the LADA's office. The DA's office had a document in their safe that it took us 20 plus years to get where they had made him a confidential informant. And so at the end of 1966, after 25 plus years, where Pratt was in custody, we finally got a hearing for him. This was a great breakthrough. And when I say he was in custody for 27 years, understand this, when he sentenced to life, the first eight years of his sentence was in solitary confinement. He spent 23 hours of every day in a jail cell. And the only time he'd be let out was times when his life was at risk because California has these prison gangs, the ABs, the Aryan Brotherhood, the MMs, the Mexican Mafia, the, the BGFs, the Black Guerrilla family. And he would be let out when the ABs were on the, on the catwalk. It was constantly his life was in threat of danger. But he persevered and he believed in the system and he believed in our trying to help him. So we got this hearing. And the first thing they did was all the judges in Southern California or in California disqualified themselves because the DA was now a Superior Court judge. Well, that turned out to be a break, except they sent us to Orange County, which if you know Southern California, that's the bastion of conservatism. But we got a judge named Everett Dickey. One judge, one judge who believed in what was right, who gave us a hearing in December of 1996 that spilled over to 97. And in this hearing, we were finally able to establish some or all of the following. That our government wanted to convict this man who was the leader of the Black Panther Party so badly that they wiretapped my phone as counsel, that they had an informant in what they call the defense environs. They still won't tell us who that is, an informant in the defense environs who went back and told them every night what we were doing. That this jury that was hopelessly, de hopelessly deadlocked after six days stayed out another six days before they finally, and they mysteriously then changed and reached a verdict. That the key witness for the prosecution who said that Pratt had confessed to him, Julius Butler, a one-time sheriff's deputy, was in fact an informant that at the time I asked him during the trial, are you now, have you ever been an informant for the FBI and any other agents? And he said no, had informed 33 times at that point. And they engaged in, so, in semantic sophistry, things like, well, when he said that, he, he thought you meant he was a paid informant. They lie. So as you know, one famous politician once said that extremism in the pursuit of virtue is no vice. And some people really believe that. But we're talking about lives here of citizens who may not be popular, but they're American citizens. And so this went on for a period of time as we had this hearing, and it took the judge until May 29th to render his decision. But on June 10th, Geronimo Pratt walked out of prison, basically a free man, even though the DA is appealing, after 27 years. The judge ruled that he didn't receive a fair trial. The reason I mention his case is because I think his case bespeaks this idea of justice. It's difficult to obtain. Either you have to have a lot of resolve or a lot of money to fight and to maintain. You can obtain it. It's still the best system in the world, but it's not perfect. And as I close, I want to share these thoughts with you. It is not un-American to talk about these problems in our system. That's how you change things. That's why, in addressing you today, I hope that something I say will stay with you. You are our future. You have this opportunity. You as a DA, if you decide to become a lawyer and go in the DA's office, you won't sit there while a witness lies on the stand and let an innocent man go to prison and you go on and become a judge someday. And when that happens, somebody has to have the courage to stand up. Finally, the reason why all the judges in LA County disqualified themselves was GQ did an article and they asked me what I thought about this judge. Now it's tough to talk about judges, isn't it? They asked me what I thought about this judge. I said he wasn't morally fit to be on the bench. And the judge says, well, we got to disqualify all the judges now, Mr. Cotton, because you said that. Well, that turned out to be a great break because we got out of LA County. And even though we went to Orange County where they thought it would be bad, we had an honorable person. So you have to stand up. So that's the message, you stand up. If you stand up for justice, you can make a difference. Our history is replete with this over and over again. Race plays far too great a role in all of these situations. And I'd love for a society that would be totally colorblind where race is something that you run. We haven't reached that point yet, but it's not un-American to talk about it. And this idea about playing some race card is ridiculous. That is some media term. Race is serious. It's not any card game, and I don't play about it. But you have to talk about it where it's appropriate. Because ultimately, if you're going to be an advocate, as I urge you to be, you're someone who stands up against all of the forces. You don't back up, you don't blink, you don't flinch. 
It's not about popularity. I want to be loved, I hope my wife loves me, but then the rest of it, respect me. That's all you ever ask. And you take that kind of an attitude as you go forward in whatever role you pursue. You stand up for what you believe in. When you do that, you can help change the society. You can make that Kerner Commission report. We can reverse that, because we have moved toward these two societies. No one would listen to Governor Kerner. We, we knew about that in the justice system, but now it's come to pass. It'll be another 30 years, and how will things be at that point? doesn't solve the problem. To lock everybody up and kill everybody else, that's not an answer in a civilized society. We can do better, but the future depends upon you and people like you all across this country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll now have a commentary from my colleague, Randall Kennedy, uh, who is a graduate uh, of Princeton University with honors in Yale Law School, where he was a member of the Yale Law Journal. He also served as an intern with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, he served as a law clerk to a great liberal justice from the D.C. Circuit, Skelly Wright, and then clerked uh, for the esteemed Associate Justice Thurgood Marshall on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, he is a professor at Harvard Law School where he's taught uh, for over a decade. And he is the publisher and editor of a critically acclaimed magazine called Reconstruction uh, that covers popular culture and the African American community probably more extensively than any other commentary. And the recent, uh, the published and critically acclaimed book, Race, Crime, and Law, uh, which covers the gamut of issues in the criminal justice system as they relate to race. He teaches courses in contracts, criminal law, race relations in the law, uh, and is well known as, as a very successful, thoughtful, and brilliant scholar in the criminal justice system. Please welcome Professor Randall Kennedy. Thank you very much for the generous introduction. I um, thoroughly enjoyed uh, Mr. Cochran's remarks. And for the bulk of uh, my commentary, we'd just like to underline a couple of the points that he made, starting out, number one, with his comments about the death penalty. This should certainly strike home in this state. This state just uh, fairly recently was one vote away from having the death penalty reintroduced into the jurisprudence of Massachusetts. That's a tremendous danger that we face uh, in the Commonwealth. And um, I certainly hope that we will all uh, take to heart Mr. Cochran's caution about uh, the death penalty the death penalty is run by human beings. Human beings make mistakes, uh, even under the best of circumstances. So we, we have to be careful, and I certainly hope that we'll all be vigilant. Second, there was the point he made about the shoe being on the other foot. I think that this is a, a way of analyzing things that needs to be reinforced a lot more. His point was that uh, if, the, if the racial demographics of prison, or the racial demographics of joblessness, or the racial demographics of the other signs of social dysfunction in the society were different. And um, uh, these, uh, these tremendous social menaces were menaces that affected larger sections of the white community, or as large sections of the white community as they affect sections of the black and other colored communities. If that were the case, if the shoe were on the other foot, would our politicians act differently? And his suggestion was that they would, and it seems to me that there's good reason for believing that. And in analyzing all that we do, it seems to me that that, that approach, that question, is one that uh, needs to be foremost uh, in our minds. Third, in the introduction to um, uh, Mr. Uh, Cochran's remarks, my colleague Charles Ogletree mentioned that uh, uh, Mr. Cochran used to be a prosecutor. And it seems to me that that's something that needs attention I come into contact with a good number of law students who have um, uh, rejected, have eschewed uh, uh, careers in prosecutor's offices, 
or careers in law enforcement generally uh, on the grounds that they didn't want to, in a sense, join up with the enemy. It seems to me that that's a terribly misguided uh, approach. The fact of the matter is that we need very much uh, uh, people uh, who are smart and intelligent and who, are, and who have good values uh, to be prosecutors and police officers and police bureaucrats and the heads of prison systems. After all, uh, the, uh, these are the people who are the guardians of law and order. These are the people who uh, protect uh, the citizenry. And that is an important public function, and we ought to want people of the highest caliber uh, in those positions uh, of uh, authority. A lesser, uh, a, a lesser theme in Mr. Cochran's remarks, one that was there, but it was, it was, I think, muted, and I would like to sort of bring it to the surface a bit more, is the problem of crime as a menace. Mr. Cochran mentioned that in Los Angeles, and in fact, around the country, those who are most victimized by homicide, by rape, by robbery, uh, by violent crime of all sorts, are poor people, especially poor people in racial minority communities. These are people who need uh, the protection of the state. After all, rich people can opt out. Rich people can go to gated communities. Rich people can hire their own bodyguards. Rich people can use their resources to protect themselves. It's poor people who need the protection of the state against criminality. Crime is a major problem facing people in minority communities, especially poor minority communities. And that is a, an issue that needs to bulk large in our discussions. Now, there is something of a problem here, or at least a dilemma. If it, because crime, like many things in the United States, is racially segmented. Uh, most people who uh, murder black people are other black people. Now, if the state does more, and it should, to uh, protect all people against criminality, if the state does more uh, to go after the victimizers of people of color, there's a dilemma there. On the one hand, it seems to me uh, it's, a, it's a good thing. It ought to be done uh, because one of the state's primary roles is to protect the citizenry against crime. On the other hand, doing that will also necessarily lead to more people of color being prosecuted, being in prison, being on death row. That is a dilemma that we ought to think about, um, or at least be aware of. It's not as if this problem of um, the problem facing minority communities is simply a problem on one front. It's a problem on at least two fronts. The problem of underprotection, ordinary people in their day-to-day -day lives being menaced by crime with too little response by the government. That's part, that's one front. The other front is, of course, the problem of the, crim of the suspect or the defendant who is treated badly in the courtroom. Those are two very important fronts but they have to be, it seems to me, face at the same time. Finally, finally, and here we may have a disagreement. I'm not altogether sure. But just one point. There's, a, there's an issue that's been out in the, in the press a considerable amount in the, in, the, uh, in the past couple of years, this crack cocaine, powder cocaine distinction. The claim is sometimes made that the crack cocaine, powder cocaine distinction is racist. Under this distinction, as a matter of federal law, if you traffic in crack cocaine, you go to jail for a lot longer time than if you, powder, if you uh, traffic in powder cocaine. And some people have said that this is racist because the racial demographics of this distinction lead to racial minority folks going to jail for longer periods of time. Now, 
Mr. Cochran said that this is unfair. He didn't say, and here I just ask for clarification, he didn't say it was racially unfair, he just said it was unfair. Now, in my view, it seems to me that this crack, coke, this crack powder distinction, along with the entire war on drugs, needs to be rethought. I think there's good grounds for believing that it has become counterproductive. Uh, I think there's good reason to think that we need to, that we need to reconsider it and modify it in a major way. Um, that's different than saying that the crack cocaine, powder cocaine distinction is racist. Mr. Cochran didn't say that, but some people do. And I think that that is probably uh, a mistake. One of the things that I did in, in, in doing research about the crack cocaine, powder cocaine distinction is to go to the uh, congressional record and see when did crack cocaine surface before Congress? Who were the people who first talked about crack cocaine? The people who first talked about crack cocaine were people like Charles Rangel, African American representative of Harlem, and other African American representatives who 15 years ago said, listen, there's this terrible type of co cocaine, crack cocaine, that's menacing our communities. We need to do something about it. Something was done about it. Now again, it might have been counterproductive. It seems to me it has been. It may very well have been a mistake, a misjudgment. It seems to me that that's the sort of rhetoric that one might want to use in addressing this problem, as opposed to the, ra as opposed to the rhetoric of genocide, racism, etc. Again, to go back to the beginning and to really sum up and make my major point, I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Cochran that we have many problems staring us in the face. I couldn't agree with him more, though, that when he said that as bad as our system is, and it certainly has many flaws, it also has within it the resources to right itself. So again, speaking for myself, I certainly appreciated your comments very much and look forward to having a nice discussion with everybody here. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, take uh, questions from the audience. There are two microphones down here and one upstairs, two upstairs as well. I wanted to give Commissioner Watson at least acknowledge him if he'd like to ask a question. We have Commissioner Watson, who is the commissioner of the Cambridge Police Department, and formerly from Chicago, who has to deal with these issues of race in the criminal justice system. An opportunity, if you'd like to make a, you just listen, okay? Uh, oh, welcome very much. There's a microphone here. There's one here, uh, and two upstairs, and you have to identify yourselves uh, when you uh, ask your question. Let me start to my left. I'm Anna Perez, and I'm a fellow here at the IOP. I have a question for Mr. Cochran. Um, with all of its vast resources, the LA County government, there are hundreds if not thousands of attorneys, there are tens of millions of dollars of budgets. How in the world did your rather small law firm become, how did they get to be the underdog <laughs> during the O.J. Simpson trial, and you sort of... <laughs> well. I understand the question. The, 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 I, I don't think they really were the underdogs. I, I think that was a, um, a media perception. And you know, if you, let, me, let me put it this way. The prosecution in the Simpson case spent in excess of $10 million. They had 42 lawyers or law clerks assigned to their, um, their team. They, had, they outgunned us, they outnumbered us, whatever. We, we just had a lot more resolve. We weren't interested in any kind of we were interested in working, basically. and We didn't have to just talk all the time about what we we're going to do. We tried to just go about and do it, and we tried to keep our eyes on the prize. Because I think that you know, we, were, we were advocates, and, and we just did that. Uh, the point is, though, I'll say this, and, and this plays right into it. If Simpson didn't have the resources that he had, he'd clearly be in prison today. It would not be possible to, to hire a Michael Batten or a um, Dr. Henry Lee to come in and talk about DNA. 
So resources play a big, big role, make no mistake about it. If you don't have the resources, you're going to be in trouble in this country. In some places in, in this country, uh, when they talk about having a death penalty case, the lawyer who's appointed to defend you in the state of Georgia gets $2,000. And you know, the, the, the conclusion is foregone, what's going to happen to you. Because there's a couple of cases in Columbus, Georgia that, that are frightening, where they go from the old days where they said, let's just string them up. So stop them by the courthouse, and the trial takes one day. Then they go string them up, and it becomes real tough. So you, you have to be very careful. But I think that that was just a perception. That was the media perception that somehow the prosecution was the underdog. They had all these resources. They had all these people on their team, but yet they may want to make it seem like they were outnumbered. Uh, that wasn't so. We are, I just want to remind you, we're not going to be able to take all your questions because this is going to end in a short period of time. So you can stand there, but be forewarned that we won't get, we won't get to all of you. To the right. Yes. Hi, I'm an undergrad student from Wellesley, but I had a question either for Mr. Cochran or Mr. Kennedy. I'm wondering about the case of Leonard Peltier and if you think that the criminal justice system can be used to um, help him or, or what you see for the future of that case. I would hope so. The day that Geronimo Pratt was uh, freed, the supporters of Leonard Peltier were there. Uh, I think he's been declared to be an, uh, a political prisoner, and I, there, there are a number of movements around the country, and I certainly hope we can keep working to get him out. There, there are a number of Amnesty International. That was one of the big helpful things in Pratt, was they declared him to be a political prisoner. We do have political prisoners in this country, as hard as that is for some people to believe, and, and I think we have to keep working for those cases, and you can never give up. You've got to keep working and keep the resources in, and I certainly hope that his day will soon come. You didn't give your name? Oh. Oh. Sorry. My name is Jocelyn Benson. Okay. Uh, top left. Good afternoon. My name is Chuck Meadows. I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a graduate of Morehouse College and a student here at the Kennedy School. My question is uh, specifically directed toward Mr. Cochran. Um, you remarked on the difficulty of trying cases in, quote, bastions of conservatism, unquote, such as Orange County. And my question is, um, within this advocacy of judicial reform that you reported in your comments. Is there room for incorporation of conservative values? Is there room for people who um, sort of harbor at the, the uh, right end of the political spectrum in this sort of judicial reform? Or will um, reform, legal reform, something that seems like it's good for all of America, always be a liberal goal? Well, I certainly hope not. I think that the one way we bring about is by bringing all Americans together on, on what is right. I mean, I think that if, if people really understood that we are on occasion executing innocent people, that there is this great disparity in how we treat people, that justice isn't uneven. Professor Kennedy said, it, it, you know, we're all human beings. They make a lot of mistakes. That you can take two defendants with the same facts and send them into two different courtrooms and get equally opposite results. Because it's not a perfect system. It's not a, it's not a science. And so I think we need to work on those things. We can't keep putting these Band-Aid solutions on problems. We have to go back, it seems to me, ultimately, to some of the root causes of crime why people go out and commit crimes, because it does impact, as Professor Kennedy said again, on certain communities. We've got to change some of those things. You know, these programs about education really is the key. Not everybody's going to get an education, but we need to have it open for everybody to have that opportunity. That's why I'm so troubled by all the rollback of affirmative action, because if you don't have an opportunity to, to get out of whatever precarious position you're in, it won't change, and you are then stuck and mired in this hopelessness. When you're hopeless, that's when you go out and commit. You don't care. Twice in my career, I've seen in Los Angeles the city go up in flames. In, in 1992, the last time, and in 1965, where enough people didn't care enough that they, they, they burned down the city, basically. It was $1 billion, and over 50 people killed. Now, that's hopelessness at its worst when you burn down your own community. You don't have a stake in anything, and we've got to get away from that. And it seems to me whether liberals and conservatives should understand that and do something about it. Thank you. Yep. Professor Kennedy? On the, on the question of uh, conservatives uh, in, in this discussion, I'd say I'd like to make two points. One, um, one of the central themes of, of many conservatives is the need for being very careful with respect to government. And one of the sort of central themes is we have to watch governmental actors because governmental actors are people necessarily with power and we all know that power corrupts. That's absolutely true. That's a very, that's a great idea. I think that this idea needs to be expanded and that conservatives need to join with others in putting uh, more watchfulness on the problem of police 
I mean, after all, the government, the agents of the state with whom most citizens come into contact are police. I think police have a very tough job. I certainly have known of you know, many wonderful police officers, but the fact of the matter is that if you believe in limited government, as many conservatives do, then you should definitely believe in the necessity for doing a better job of policing the police than our legal system currently does. It does an abysmal job now of limiting uh, police abuses. Secondly, if one is a conservative, another sort of major theme of conservatives over the past quarter century, certainly, has been the idea of law and order. Good idea, law and order. We need law and order. People need security in order to be happy people. One of the biggest impediments to law and order today is the feeling of distrust, the feeling of resentment, uh, the feeling of antagonism that many people, especially in minority communities, feel toward the police. We need to drain these feelings of resentment, and if that, this is done, it will enable the police to more effectively do their jobs. So it seems to me that in this struggle, uh, there, there's no need for there being any sort of ideological exclusion. People from a wide range of ideological camps should be able to find common ground in uh, the uh, uh, in improving uh, the administration of criminal justice in the United States. Next question, uh, upper right. Mr. Cochran, uh, I understand you're under some emotional distress because of a columnist for the New York Post having dared speak ill of you uh, last summer. And here you are returning her words with a $10 million libel suit. Shame on you for, for not <laughs> Come on. Is there a question? Go ahead. <laughs> we want the mics on. Yeah. The right of free speech. I hope you don't suffer some emotional distress here today. I would recommend Professor Kennedy's book on the matter of capital punishment for a less sympathetic view of, of your view, Mr. Cochran, and a more uh, pro capital punishment, pro law and order on that count comes from Mr. Kennedy, Professor Kennedy. Is there a question there, sir? Do you have a question? Okay, let's hear it, please. <laughs> Next question. I just wanted to thank you both very much for very enlightening comments this afternoon. It's certainly been very stimulating. Uh, my name is Justin Dan Levitz. Um, I'm an undergraduate at Harvard College, and I'm I'm taking a seminar with Professor Jeffrey Abramson on the jury system. Um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about jury nullification um, and if you think that played a role in the O.J. Simpson trial. I don't think it did in the O.J. Simpson case. Uh, I think we hear a lot about this concept of jury nullification now in the post-Simpson thing. But if you recall, in that great case, one of the things that we tried to argue to the jury was that we felt this was a case of reasonable doubt. You could have all the thoughts you want about what may or may have happened on June 12th of 1994, but nobody in this room was, hit, was there and no other American was out there. Only, only maybe one or two people know what happened out there that night. The prosecution had the burden of proving uh, this man guilty beyond a reasonable doubt until moral certainty. If they failed in that, the defendant was entitled to an acquittal. And it was very interesting to me that when the jury came back, 
they said when asked, why did it only take four hours for a case that took a year? They said, how much reasonable doubt did we need? And if you look at the early statistics on the case, people who watched the case day in and day out said they felt there was a reasonable doubt in the case. And I think that was simply what it was. And I think the concept, I don't believe in jury nullification because I, I think it's not, it's not appropriate, it's not legal. But I think, I mean, it happens sometimes. I don't think it happened in this case, however. Well, a couple things, and one to, on the, on the death penalty question that the gentleman raised, and I'll, and I'll get to the question that was just asked about jury nullification. Reference was made to a, a, a book that I, I wrote, and in that book I said that I was uh, uh, sort of a, a mild death penalty uh, abolitionist. Uh, I certainly can understand the arguments for those who uh, are in favor uh, of the death penalty. I've, I know many very reasonable people, good people, who are in favor of the death penalty. Um, I guess I disagree with them now more than I, when I wrote that book. And, uh, but still, it seems to me that there are arguments to be made on, on both sides. With respect to the question of, of facts and figures, I think that the whole question of racial discrimination in the administration of capital punishment uh, in some aspects is a very complicated picture and oftentimes the complications are lost sight of. There is one thing, however, about punishment in general that is not complicated at all and there is one statistic that is a very clear statistic and a statistic that it seems to me to uh, say a lot about the administration of criminal justice in America and says a lot that's negative. I know of no court in the history of the United States that has ever found racial discrimination in the administration of a penalty. Now what's so striking about that is that anybody who knows anything about the United States knows that of course there has been racial discrimination in the administration of penalties as in all other sectors of the administration of justice. Yet there has never been a finding of selective prosecution, racially selective prosecution. There's never been a finding. Never been a finding of racial discrimination in the administration of any penalty, much less a death penalty. And that, it seems to me, is a very sobering statistic. On the question of jury nullification, I guess I, I differ a little bit with my colleague, uh, Mr. Cochran. I would never answer the question that I'm against jury nullification under all circumstances. Rather, my response would be, it depends on the circumstances. Certainly in the 19th century, there were instances of jury nullification, which I certainly applaud. Jury nullification in the, in, in, in the face, for instance, of the federal fugitive slave law, when people simply refused to convict people who uh, stood in the way of the enforcement of that evil law. Those were people who were engaged in jury nullification, and I say thank God for them. Now, the question is, under current circumstances, do we have a current circumstance in which jury nullification uh, is, um, uh, is justifiable? And, from, and I, from my reading of the situation, the answer is probably not. I think that you have to have an extraordinarily good reason to engage in jury nullification. That the strong presumption should be that you follow the law as set down. Um, with respect to the Simpson case, uh, ob no, I certainly didn't watch it every day. And uh, I'm sure that your familiarity with it is, uh, you know, a hundred times, if not a thousand <laughs> times more than mine. From my perspective and of, as an observer, though, my sense was that I got the sense that all sorts of things were happening with that jury. <laughs> <laughs> that there were some people who were very sensible and ultimately came to the conclusion that there was reasonable doubt based on the evidence that's presented before them. And I think observers should always recognize that a criminal trial, you only have certain evidence that's presented to you. I mean, if you're watching out in TV, you know a lot of things that a lot of times the jurors don't know. So there were some jurors who, based on what they knew, quite sensibly came to the conclusion. You might disagree with them, but they were reasonable people. They came to the conclusion of reasonable doubt. I got the sense of some people who 
were unreasoning in their demands on the prosecution. And I also got the sense that there were maybe a couple of people who, for, you know, I don't know why, maybe a sense of anger at the system, which would be understandable, this was LA after all, um, who might have been engaging in jury nullification. One of the interesting things about the jury system is that it's a black box, it's 12 people, it's very hard to figure out what the heck was going on. I can believe that there were all those things and probably more that were going on. I think the professor makes an interesting point. I don't think it was jury nullification, but I think if you, if you live in Los Angeles, as Anna Perez does, it would be hard to find any citizen who didn't have strong feelings about the LAPD. If the LAPD became the messengers, if they became part and parcel of those who were bringing the message, then that had to play a large part. I think it really did. But the gentleman up there who's, uh, who, who went on and on, I couldn't quite understand the question. He should just remember this one fact. Up until just recently, no white person in the history of this country had ever been given the death penalty for killing a black. And if you look back at the history of this country, that will say, that speaks volumes to this whole thing. I don't think you have to say any more than just that one question uh, about the whole history of, of racism uh, in, in the law. Next question to the right. Hello, um, my name is James Mayers. I'm from Augusta, Georgia. I'm a freshman at Harvard College. And, um, when you go in a courtroom, do you detect um, negative preconceived ideas about who you are, and how do you deal with that so that justice is carried out for your clients? Well, you know, I, you, don't, you can't be sensitive, you see. <laughs> you just, you are, are you talking pre-Simpson, post-Simpson? What are you asking? Uh, no, uh, basically, you just can't be sensitive. You know, uh, what happens is that if you take stands in this society, uh, some people are going to like them, some people are not. But that's not, I don't take the stand because of the fact that uh, uh, I want to curry favor with somebody. I don't hold up my hand and say, gee, I think I'll represent this client because this, this is politically correct. When, when I got involved in representing Latrell Sprewell, that's a good example. <laughs> that wasn't the most popular thing to do, but I felt that what happened to him, you, I can't, you can't go around choking people. Now, that's very clear. <laughs> but uh, by the same token, you don't get the death penalty for choking somebody. You don't obliterate the contract without a hearing and that sort of thing. So you take a stand, and then you see it through. That's what justice is about. You then try to have a hearing. So now he had a hearing. And a mediator and arbitrator hears the facts, and he changes it. You don't, you're not always right, but you know, sometimes you feel vindicated by the position you take. So what, what I have found is that um, hopefully when you walk into a courtroom, you're respected by your adversaries. That's all you do. I don't threaten anybody. I just go there to do my job. But the one thing I'll say to you as a, as a, as a student, the three keys to success as far as I'm concerned practicing law are one, preparation, two, preparation, three, <laughs> preparation. I will never be out prepared by any other lawyer on the other side. And you keep that in mind whatever you do, okay? Final question. My question is for Mr. Conqueror. Interesting that you would bring up the Latrosse Str Sprewell situation. I'm here at the Kennedy School of Government visiting a friend of mine. I'm actually a sportscaster in Phoenix. You've been a lot of talk uh, in my world the last couple of years. Uh, I, my question, first of all, I'd like to know, as a member of the media, I do not use the term race card. I never have and never will. Good. I don't like it. I also will say to you in, in a roundabout way with questions in regarding Latrell Sprewell, um, within my colleagues, our questions now are, why is Johnny Cochran there every time we see a star celebrity black athlete? Is he going to be in the picture? People have said that. Within my colleagues, I would ask what you would uh, say to that. And I would also ask, uh, would you have felt yourself needing to get involved if it was a Rick Smith or a Tom Gugliotta that t had done the same situation? Yeah, I don't, I don't pick and choose people according to race. I, if uh, you're in Los Angeles, when Reginald Denny in the situation, a lot of people said, gee, how can you defend him? How can you represent him? He's white. I don't, I, if I see injustice, or what I perceive to be injustice, I go where that is, not because of race. I'm not interested because of your race or whatever. I mean, I'm interested, in, I understand the subject of race. But uh, no, it, it would just depend upon what the facts are. Uh, I think that um, I got, quite simply, I was retained by Mr. Uh, Sprewell to get involved, like any other client. You know, it's so interesting to me that, um, I suppose that it, it, that it's so interesting that someone would be concerned about a lawyer representing clients in America. So that if I would go as if, like, I'm going to pull some tremendous rabbit out of a hat, right. and if I'm going to go right. someplace, I mean, it, you know, the amount of worry and fear is really interesting. I, I don't govern my life by what people out there in the media are worried about what I'm going to be next. But, you know, and when I came to New York, you know, um, I represent Abner Lewima. 
They were worried, oh God, here he comes, here comes the team. <laughs> you know, and, and what's happened is, since we got there is that now in a press, unprecedented fashion, the U.S. Attorney's Office has indicted five police officers, and now they're looking at the Patrolman Benev Patrolman's Benevolent Association, the union, to go after you know, this whole 48-hour rule and how you can't talk to police for 48 hours after some mm -hmm. thing. So I hope that we bring in some experience. And, you know, I don't pick and choose, uh, you know, based upon race. I look at the particular case. But most of the time, I represent not the OJs, the famous boy. I represent the, the no Jays that you never heard about. <laughs> That's who I'm most interested in representing. Thank you. Uh, one announcement to let you know that uh, next Wednesday on uh, March 11th at Harvard Law School, Randall Robinson uh, will be the speaker. Uh, he has a new book called Defending the Spirit. That will be at 4 o'clock in Pound Hall, room 102 at Harvard Law School. I believe there's some flyers around here if you'd like to get one. Uh, oh, there they are right there. Uh, and. Um, uh, Randall Robinson was the uh, president of Trans Africa and was very instrumental in the end of apartheid in South Africa. Uh, uh, and there will be many other public forums here as well. Uh, again, we'd like to thank you. This is one of the few places where all voices uh, are heard uh, and all questions uh, are answered, if not in the formal setting, uh, certainly uh, before this is over. We're very grateful that uh, my colleague, Randall Kennedy, is here. You, you, yeah. Uh, and that uh, Johnny Cochran flew here from New York and is flying right back, and he expects that you'll be watching Cochran and Company at 9 o'clock tonight uh, on Court TV, uh, and he'll, he may even say something about this Harvard crowd. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Thank you.